This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Hanan. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, the genocide in Gaza continues unabated today. The death toll for Palestinians in Gaza is above 17,000. Seventy percent of the dead are women and children. And the World Food Organization announced that Gaza is under uh, conditions of complete starvation. About 1.6 million Palestinians are internally displaced as we speak. And as the Israeli military ordered Palestinians to go to the south for safety, we're finding the fiercest fighting going on uh, in Gaza right now, in the very place where the Israeli military told Palestinians to go. They've been decimated. They've been killed. Um, Many Palestinians have no food uh, in the Gaza Strip, the overwhelming majority. The genocide continues unabated, Jamal. And despite this catastrophe that's been announced by the United Nations, uh, the, the president of the Security Council, Guterres, the United Nations Security Council um, did what it's supposed to do, is take a vote to have a ceasefire. And Jamal, only one country in the entire Security Council decided to vote against a ceasefire to protect Palestinian civilians who are being slaughtered. And that one country is the United States. We're going to talk about that today. Also, and this has been making the news quite uh, quite bizarrely and, and kind of... Um, and in just kind of brutal propaganda, Israel has been conducting these mass arrests of Palestinian men, having them disrobe in the freezing cold in Gaza and taking pictures and claiming somehow that they're Hamas fighters, when in fact they're, they're Palestinian civilians in Gaza. It is a disgusting uh, display of propaganda. Uh, 100 Israeli soldiers that we know of have been killed. 5,000 have been injured in Gaza. It appears that probably that death toll and that injury toll have been underrepresented. We're going to talk about all of that today. But before we do that, we're going to watch a great interview that you did with Daoud Kutab, who's going to talk about the targeting of uh, journalists by Israel. Sixty journalists have been killed by Israel since October 7th, and they're trying to control the narrative of Gaza by cutting off all communication uh, with Israel. people in Gaza, Palestinians in Gaza, who are trying to get the word out. It's uh, it's a really disturbing interview that you did with Daoud. It's absolutely true, Jess. And uh, what I term this is, it's really now we're, we're entering in a period where this is Israel's war on journalists. And, th- and that's, that's what they've been doing, aside from killing Palestinians, of course. They've been targeting journalists one after the other. The toll uh, now is more than 63 journalists who have been killed. And they're trying to control the narrative. Fortunately, they have been failing to do so because of social media and other means. But uh, they are uh, going out of their way to target journalists both in Gaza and in, in the West Bank. And let's watch uh, the Hood Kutab, an award-winning journalist, talk about this. Israel is intent on purging independent eyewitnesses of the ongoing genocide and atrocities it is perpetrating in the Gaza Strip. Close to 70 days into Israel's assault on Gaza, more than 63 journalists have been killed, 56 of them Palestinian. 11 journalists were reported injured. 19 journalists were reported arrested with multiple assaults, threats, censorship, and killings of family members. The head of Reporters Without Borders Middle East Desk states this is one of the deadliest tolls in a century, adding that the Palestinian territory has been subjected to a veritable eradication of journalism. Palestinian reporters are not the only targets of Israel's indiscriminate mass-scale bombings and targeted strike. It is also assassinating and arresting extensive numbers of intellectuals and professionals who are Gaza's truth-tellers, articulate and intelligent. They present the humanity of Palestinian narrative in a compelling way. The Oud Kutab is joining us on Arab Talk to talk about Israel's war to shut down the Palestinian narrative, both in the media and through its citizens' discourse. He is an award-winning journalist and media activist. He is a former first professor of journalism at Princeton University and is currently Director General of Community Media Network, 
a not-for-profit organization dedicated to advancing independent media in the Arab region. Welcome back to Arab Talk, Dawood. Shukran. Thank you, Salah Jamal. The Committee to Protect Journalists states the Israel-Hamas war has been more journalists has seen more journalists killed in the first month of conflict than any other conflict since it first started collating statistics for journalists covering conflict in 1992. Under international humanitarian law, intentionally targeting journalists is considered a war crime. Journalists are meant to be allowed to have the freedom and protection to perform their work without undue interference. The Israel Occupation Forces told Reuters and Ajans France Press News agencies that it could not guarantee the safety of their journalists operating in the Gaza Strip. Talk about Israel's rogue conduct relative to reporters during this war. Well, uh, Jamal, the uh, Israeli attitude towards journalism is not new. They have bombed the Palestinian television station. They have uh, knocked down years ago an entire building in which a, a Associated Press and Al Jazeera and others were stationed in it. Um, they have never issued a government press card to a single Palestinian working for an Israel, a Palestinian media. They have done it to Palestinians working for international media, but for a Palestinian working for a Palestinian media, they don't exist. There is no nothing called Palestinian media in the Israeli lexicon. So uh, for the Israelis, every Palestinian, as the Israeli president said, it uh, is not a civilian. He's a member of, I don't know what, the terrorist organization or something like that. Uh, what is more worrisome, uh, Jamal, is that Israel has um, consciously and forcefully prevented a single Arab and international journalist to enter into Gaza. They have actually boyc- uh, blackmailed the Egyptian government, saying to them, if a single journalist enters, we will stop all aid to the 2.2 million Palestinians. This has been an amazing and unusual and unique war in the world in which not a single international journalist has been allowed in Gaza. Now, you know, when we work uh, and when our fellow journalists work, they work in groups and they protect each other by being in a group. Uh, had there been international journalists in Gaza, there would have, two things would have not happened. Journalists would not have been targeted and I believe many lives would have been prevented. And I'll give you an example. Israel created a lie that under the uh, Shifa hospital, there was an entire headquarters of uh, Hamas terrorists and so on. Now, imagine if Anderson Cooper or Tom Friedman or, I don't know, uh, KTK from BBC or anybody was in Gaza with their film crew saying, we're in Shifa, we went down, we looked everywhere, there was no Hamas headquarters. Imagine how many lives would have been saved. Just imagine that. Israel did not want a single international journalist in Gaza. And then they went after every single Palestinian journalist that they could get. And so uh, this is an uh, an attempt to control the narrative. We know what they've done with the international media, how they've been pressuring, bullying international journalists and forcing journalists to ask the most stupid questions and demand condemnation from everyone. But, and they've also done that with social media, and, and they've also killed the Palestinian journalists, and they've kept the journalists, international journalists, from getting into Gaza. Well, do you feel that mainstream media, and Western media in particular I'm talking about here, has been uh, uh, derelict uh, in their duty, that not insisting, you know, not using their power and insist to report from Gaza and, and just accept the fact that they have to passively let themselves be fed Israeli talking points while they sit in, in safe zones in, in, in Tel Aviv or elsewhere. Look at what happened yesterday, Jamal. We don't want to have to go back far. Yesterday or two days ago, Israel army in Jabal went into a school, a UN school where people were refugees, the entire family. And they took out the men. They forced the men to come out, stripped them of all their clothes, and paraded them. They forced them to sit so they can take a picture to show humiliation to the Palestinians and to please the angry Israelis who are unhappy with what's happening in Gaza. This is a war crime. This is a humiliation. This is immoral. This is illegal. And yet, 
if there was an international journal, because they were saying, these are terrorists, we had to make sure that they were not, uh, they didn't have uh, belts of suicide bombers. Look, two things that needs to be done. First, Hamas fighters are, have very strong belief in the martyr giving issue, and they would never surrender. So calling these individual civilians, and actually I know some of those people, and a number of my friends called me and said, our relatives were among those. So these were civilians taken by force, stripped uh, naked, and taken their picture, and claimed to be terrorists. They're not terrorists because Hamas doesn't surrender, and the Israeli army, they don't take prisoners. They have not taken a single prisoner in Gaza. They shoot them. They shoot civilians. Why would they take uh, parade them? They did it only for one reason, to humiliate Palestinians. Amongst them, as, as you've mentioned, actually, there was a recognized journalist and doctors and, and, and other professionals. And uh, in fact, one, one, one of the, what I call them actually at the time, hostages, uh, told his story that they were taken and transported to the beach and they were ordered to stay there until midnight, uh, of course, uh, na cold. naked in, in the, the cold. In the, in the December weather. Yeah, and they made them walk back barefooted to their homes, and they found their homes all ransacked, you know, and that's the story. So if these were terrorists, but again, I insist that the mainstream media, for example, repeats those talking points because many of those reports that I've watched on CNN and other networks saying, that Hamas members were surrendering en masse. And that's, that's the statement. I mean, don't we, you know, shouldn't they be held responsible for what's going on? You know, Jamal, if, if it's raining outside, a journalist doesn't need to say, some people say it's raining, some people say it's not raining. You don't no, do that. You say it's raining. If there was an international journalist in Gaza, they would not say Israel says these are terrorists and the Palestinians say that they were not. They would see, they would know, they would interview people, and they would say, Israel did this on purpose. It was, they would show, as you said, them returning to their homes. If they were terrorists, why would you let them go back home? So this is a crime, an immoral act by, by an army that claims to be the most moral army in the world. Media Watch organizations are calling Israel out on its practices. On October 31st, Reporters Without Borders submitted a complaint to the International Criminal Court alleging Israel had perpetrated war crimes against journalists in Gaza. But where is the outrage and solidarity among fellow journalists? <laughs> Nowhere to be found. Uh, journalists and and uh, media outlets. I'm, I'm more uh, put pressure on media outlets themselves to demand. I mean, imagine if CBS, NBC, Fox News, Reuters, CNN, BBC, all these media outlets would have said, just issued one statement saying, we demand that our members are allowed to have access to Gaza, are allowed to see uh, people, talk to people in Gaza. It would have forced Israel to change its mind. But there's no pressure. They don't have to pressure. They're only pressuring the poor Egyptians by telling them or blackmailing them that they would not allow food into Gaza. This is both the blackmailing and preventing journalists is also a crime that should not be let go. We have to do something about this. We should not allow the Israelis to get away with. It's really getting away with murder. You have a superpower like uh, the United States uh, give the green light to take out Gaza. And we saw what happened um, um, and just a few hours ago with the veto at the United uh, Nations. They give a uh, carte blanche to Israel to do, uh, to, to, you know, to commit genocide without constraints, followed by other Western, of course, powers taking up the call. Where is the concern for the safety of journalists in spite of the meaningless lip service given to the importance of their job? Look, the U.S., uh, the veto the veto of yesterday came as a result of the United Nations Security General. United Nations, Anthony Guterres, had to actually use a very unique and rarely used clause number 99 to force the Security Council to also hold the meeting. So they're not only going against the public opinion, they're going against the U.N. Security Council, a general uh, secretary general 
and they're going against the majority of their own people, the majority of the democratic Americans in the United States and the entire world. Every single country has either agreed and in the UK abstained and the US vetoed because they don't want to stop this massacre, this genocide, as you called it. And even His Holiness the Pope, which, uh, you know, Biden is supposedly a Catholic and, and a church-going Catholic, the Pope called for an end to this uh, uh, this craziness, uh, uh, and he called for a ceasefire, and he called what's happening a genocide. Of course, his uh, protectors have, have tried to say, no, he didn't say the word genocide. Twelve Palestinians with good hearing aid, they had no hearing aid there, good hearing, said they heard him say twice, this is a genocide, and yet uh, it's going on, it's allowed to go on and on and on. Talk about the blatant discrimination in framing the reporting uh, when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Uh, examples, Israelis are murdered, Palestinians either die or are killed because uh, they are Hamas or because they are human shields. Israelis are, are you know, in the media are named and described and, 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 and they have been featuring their stories. Uh, Palestinians are dismissed as numbers. Palestinians are equal players, even though they are, you know, even though they are occupied and oppressed uh, by Israel. Talk about that framing. Well, there's two problems we have to really deal with on on the way the media has covered uh, the Gaza. First, the lies. Okay, everyone knows that Israel has been lying in through their teeth. They lied about the beheading. They lied about the rape. They lied about the numbers. And unfortunately, their lies went all the way to the White House. And President Biden repeated them. And the media continues to repeat them. And social media continues to repeat these lies. They are, they are untruths, undocumented, and they would, never, they would never publish anything like this against Israel. They would say, we have to check, we have to double check, we have to make sure the facts are correct. But when it comes from Israel, they don't even double check. They just, they just repeat these lies as truths. So the problem for me is not whether they said killed. That is a problem. But for me, the problem is that they have been breaking their own guidelines by publishing one-sided stories from one side that had been proven over and over and over to have lied. So you know they lied the first time. You know, lied the second time. Why do you keep repeating these lies? Sometimes without crediting them that this came from the Israeli side. Secondly, by double-checking. Why do they have to, when we say Palestinians were attacked, they say, well, let's double check. Maybe they, they didn't really mean to kill civilians, as the spokesman of the State Department said. But when it comes to the Israelis, they don't double check. They just put it out as fact. So my problem is the fact. They are breaking their own guidelines. They are breaking their own, they're violating their own uh, commitments, the code of ethics, when it comes to the Palestinians, while insisting on it and double-checking it, even though they're not allowed to have journalists in, in Gaza, and they're not publishing uh, the other side. So um, the uh, U.S. media, the Western media, has failed miserably. And thank God that there's social media, even though there's also pressure on social media, and there's all kinds of attempts to try to download or to down uh, great social media, and the Israelis have been working with day and night to to um, menace and delete uh, entire accounts. Uh, Ahmed from, I think, uh, one of the uh, American Palestinians, American Egyptians, had yesterday had his site uh, removed from Facebook and Meta because they don't want these facts. They don't want the information. And you know what, uh, Jamal? A lot of Palestinian um, innovative people are actually trying to get around this effort by... They put up a post, and then they put an Israeli flag on the post, and they program the flag to to get out quickly. So what happens is the algorithm, which doesn't know who, who everybody is, sees the Israeli flag and allows it. But the public, they don't see the Israeli flag. So this is a clever way that, that some of the pro-Palestinian entrepreneurs are trying to break the, this uh, siege, the censorship that social media is also trying, even though 
to be honest, they're not doing very well because the world is seeing the pictures and the world is, is angry with the Israelis and with the Americans for their blatant um, refusal to, to deal with civilization. They're not even protecting civilized norms that they would normally protect. Uh, there is a broader trend here of Israel's intent, as you've mentioned, to shut down and delegitimize the Palestinian narrative from all its sources. You have iconic journalist Sharina Ba'akli, assassinated by the Israel military in 2022. We're seeing massive numbers of educated, articulate Palestinians in Gaza killed or arrested, physicians, educators, and writers who carry the uh, Palestinian narrative uh, forward. I want, I want to pay tribute to Rifat al-Ar'ir. Uh, he was a professor and the founder of We Are Not Numbers, which inspires young people in Gaza to take charge of their own narrative and write the story of Gaza and Palestine based on their own experiences. He was assassinated a few days ago after receiving a call from Israeli intelligence telling him that they were going to kill him. I mean, this is an example of monumental loss to Palestinian society on a human and generational level. How will this have an impact? I mean, if you look at it, we're losing journalists, the Palestinians, they're losing educators, they're losing physicians, they're losing intellectuals. How will Palestinians recover from, from all of this? Well, look, I, you know, uh, the, the problem is... It's not only how Palestinians will recover. The problem is how will the value of human rights recover? How will we recover the attitude that we've seen? How will we ever believe international advocates who talk about human rights when their own governments are violating human rights, when their own uh, leadership are stepping on human rights and they're not respecting human rights? I think they, what American officials in Washington and, and British officials in, in London and, and in Germany and others don't realize is that their attitude, their position is shaking the entire international system of values. We know that after World War II, everybody got together and said, you know, we have to, to have a new world order. They started the UN and all. Now we're seeing that the UN is unable to do anything. UN Security Generalist words are, are worthless. The UN Security Council is being hampered by the Israel, US veto. And the system, the, the value system, is what is the problem. I think we will recover, Palestinians will recover, but the value system will not recover. We will take it, will take a long time, and people will have to prove that they were not part of this uh, hypocrisy. About, about human values and human rights that we will see uh, or we will not see in the future. So for me, the, the, um, the problem is that we have uh, violated, we have broken up a value system that many of us believe in, and we still believe in the value system. We just don't believe in the governments that are defending it or claim to be defending it. Has the United States fully lost its credibility in, in being a peacemaker as, or a mediator in, in the Middle East? You know, they're sending ammunition. They're sending, they're sending ammunition to Israel to continue killing civilians. They're sending 2,000 kilo uh, bombs to kill Palestinians. How can they be anywhere close to being peacemakers? They are warmongers. They are killing Palestinians, they have Palestinian blood on their hands, every one of them, from the National Security Council to the White House to Congress, they have blood on their hands. Well, uh, the uh, Arab Americans, Muslim Americans right here in the United States, I know you also keep your eye on this, uh, have been saying that they will not vote for the Biden administration, they will not vote for the basically the, the Democrats in the upcoming elections. And some people are saying that they are shooting themselves in the foot. I mean, what options do they have? Well, we are in December and uh, we're 11 months away from the U.S. election. So um, uh, a lot has, it depends on, on who will be running against Biden. 
uh, whether it be Trump or whether it be Nikki Haley or whether it be somebody else. Uh, so they are, you know, we have bad choices. Everybody has bad choices coming up. Um, I think there is a difference between uh, voting for president and voting for Congress. I think Democrats uh, should uh, be supported, especially the, you know, the ones who are honest uh, Democrats. But uh, on the issue of presidency, I think it's going to be difficult. I think people uh, are simply going to stay home and not vote at all, rather than vote for either uh, Biden or Trump or Nikki Haley or, you know, Ron and Santos. There's no, no good choices here. Uh, and I think many Palestinian and many Arab Americans, many progressives, don't want to be responsible and don't want to have their name connected to the real election or uh, election of, you know, anti-Palestinian warmongers. It's a tough choice, and it, you're right that it could be uh, shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, and I think it's important that the White House understands that what they're doing is causing them to lose uh, many of their loyal supporters. There is a generational gap, as we've been witnessing uh, on the streets, and I'm talking uh, globally, not just in the United States. Uh, you know, I think uh, for the first time since I ever been watching this, that, that I've seen this this many uh, young people demonstrating to calling for a ceasefire against basically the wishes of Congress, against the wishes of the administration. We've seen also thousands and thousands of them demonstrating in London, uh, in France, and 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 all uh, all over all over the world. What what? kind of influence is this going to have uh, in the future, do you think? I think we, I think a number of things have to be uh, reassessed. I think um, the value system has to be reassessed. The mechanism for implementing and defending and fighting uh, to protect the value system has to be reassessed. The work of the International C Criminal Court has to be reassessed. The need for a much faster uh, intervention by international uh, uh, organization has to be reassessed, and I think uh, I think legacy media, the official um, media, has to uh, to be reassessed and has to take uh, a serious look inward as what they have been doing or what they've not been doing, and what uh, they've allowed all the lies that they have allowed to go in print or on television. And uh, it's going to require a huge change. And I think uh, we, the public, we, the uh, listeners, readers, viewers, uh, have to also uh, make decisions about what we see, who we, who we subscribe to, who we support, which products are advertised on these media. We have to make a strong effort to let them pay a price for the, for breaking their own guidelines, for breaking their own uh, guidelines of credibility. We have to make a decision on on what media uh, we should support and what media we should fight again. Are you talking about boycotts? I mean, because uh, that's the other avenue that uh, Palestinians have been trying to uh, utilize for many years to boycott uh, companies that support um, Israel, support genocide, support the occupation. I think, you know, uh, one has to uh, hold these media account to their own guidelines. I think you should, we have to do a, a much better job at uh, exposing, much better job at uh, showing the light, much better job at uh, explaining how uh, the bias has infiltrated into the newsrooms of major media outlets and demand uh, change. How do we do demand change? What mechanism people choose? I'm not about to tell uh, which means people use. They want to use boycott. They want to boycott the products that are advertised. They want to uh, engage with the editorial boards. All of these things have to be done. We need to be much better organized the way the other side is organized. We have to use our money. We have to use our votes. We have to use our... Uh, uh, supporters to make the change. Uh, 
media can only survive if people read and, and, and engage with it. So we have a huge power that we have not, I think, I mean, the hundreds of thousands of people come out in demonstrations must also act uh, in, in the same way towards the media. They should uh, find ways to hold the media accountable and punish the media that has not been living up to the public standards of, of uh, credibility. The last time you and I uh, spoke on, on this program, we talked about the visa waiver uh, program, which uh, basically passed. Uh, one thing we haven't spoken about uh, now is uh, how Israel has been not so quietly um, attacking, especially, especially the settlers attacking uh, Palestinians in, in the West Bank and killing them uh, almost on a, on a daily basis. And recently, Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary and Anthony Blinken, said that, uh, that they will uh, punish or stop people who are... Uh, uh, coming to the United States will revoke their visas. Do you have any comment on this? Well, I'm not sure what the status of the visa waiver is today. I am. My some of my relatives, American Palestinians, say that they are not allowed to go to to the uh, Ben Gurion Airport. They had to come via Jordan, uh, American citizen. So um, I think Israel is not honoring its part of that uh, deal. And I would use your forum to uh, to call on the U.S. government to suspend the visa waiver since Israel is not respecting it. Now, of course, Israel is saying it's time of war and, you know, international uh, during war, uh, the laws are suspended. But the fact is that they are allowing Jews in, but not allowing uh, Jewish Americans, but they're not allowing Arab Americans into uh, Ben-Gurion, especially those who are residents of the West Bank. So I think the visa waiver um, needs to be reassessed based on the Israeli violations of their commitments. Secondly, uh, you know, it's a bit too little too late what uh, Blinken is doing, especially since the settlements have not stopped. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, one has to say that this is a good decision and uh, needs to be followed up. We need to see whether, in fact, they are... Um, genuinely preventing uh, violators and criminals from entering the U.S., I, I have my doubts, but, you know, the decision is a good decision uh, in terms of policy on, on paper. Uh, you know, I will hold my breath and I will not make any final decision on how they will do it. Uh, I'd like to see them preventing being veer from entering to, to the U.S. and so on. But... Um, a lot more needs to be done. I think this is a this is a slap on the on the hand when Palestinians or three hundred Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank. People are paying attention to Gaza, but civilian Palestinians, there is no Hamas uh, in 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 the West Bank, and they're still killing Palestinians right, left, and center. Just yesterday, I think five or six in Tukarim or Kalkilia were killed. So the Israelis are uh, acting in a, in a very um, criminal way against civilians in the West Bank. Daoud Kutab, um, thank you for coming on Arab Talk. Thank you, Jamal. That's the voice and the face of award-winning journalist Daoud Kutab speaking about the attack on journalists, uh, Palestinian journalists and journalists covering what's happening in Gaza and the West Bank and Jerusalem uh, to get the word out uh, about the atrocities that are committed right now. Um, you know, Jamal, I mean, and Dawood and you spoke about this. Uh, Israel has always targeted journalists, but what's happening now is that it's ramping up and being much more aggressive in its targeting of journalists. I mean, over 60 have been killed. Uh, they're killing journalists in, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in the West. I mean, it's, it's an all-out attack on the word and the visuals and the imagery and the news coming directly from Palestine is, is attempting to be silenced and cut off. It's, it's a disturbing development. Not only they're attacking them, killing them, but they're imprisoning them, injuring them, going after their families, believe it yes. or not. I mean, journalists are losing their entire families because they've been targeting their homes. I mean, some of these journalists, the ones who survived, and they are, they've been hauled uh, as, as they were you know, going live, broadcasting 
uh, reporting on the news, and then they find out, or uh, or I saw sadly one of the journalists being reporting on the uh, on the death toll and and all these injured in front of a hospital, and then the word comes around to him that his family, his home was bombed, his parents got killed, his entire family basically, his children were killed. I mean, it's 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 something beyond belief, and. Uh, they're trying to control, control the narrative, as uh, Dahoud uh, spoke about this. They have been doing a poor job at this, besides killing the journalists, because the news is out. But the big story in all of this, Jess, is the sad status of journalism in general, Western journalism, when you have uh, you know, American reporters, British reporters, and others uh, reporting on the news, uh, you know, from their hotels, uh, comfortable hotels in Tel Aviv. Uh, and, uh, okay, we I understand that Israel is not allowing them in. But basically, they take the press releases from uh, the uh, Israeli military uh, spokesperson, and they, and they repeat this. And I know, exactly. I know for sure, I mean, this is now with technology, with everything else, it's not like, you know, we're not, we're not in the 18th century, Jess. They see, as we see, uh, the, the stream of news reports coming, uh, v- whether via satellite TV or on the internet, mostly broadcast by networks like Al Jazeera, both in Arabic and in English, and other networks, of people getting killed, of entire homes getting bombed, of hospitals being targeted, uh, and they will talk about the stories about civilians getting humiliated and so forth. And instead of reporting on this, they just decide to choose, you know, they measure their words and the way they talk about Palestinians being slaughtered, you know, saying Palestinians die, like mysteriously die, while, is, while Israel is getting killed. When they talk about the Israeli hostages, they humanize them, they tell their stories, but Palestinians are just numbers to them. Whether that's they're right, alive true. or dead, that's how they report on this. And that's the sad, at the end of the day, they're going to go, you know, there's going to be a black mark, uh, just like we've seen uh, what happened during the war on Iraq, uh, those journalists who get embedded and just give basically whatever is fed to them and then don't report on the on what's happening on the ground. And that's what's happening with Western journalists in a, in a very troubling and sad way. Well, it's it's beyond troubling and sad, Jamal, because what we're seeing is this complete denial of reality on the uh, Western media broadcast and print media. I mean, they're basically taking the Israeli talking points, whether from the ministry, from Netanyahu, or from the military, kind of cleaning them up a little bit and then regurgitating them in, mm-hmm. in the mainstream media because... The reality on the ground, we are getting from TikTokers, from Instagrammers, from Palestinians, you know, in Gaza, who, and this is really tragic, you and I both see this, who are eulogizing themselves on TikTok because they're saying to us, we're going to die any moment, this is my last TikTok. I mean, the gravity and the depravity uh, of what we're seeing in terms of Western media uh, misrepresentations and uh the denial, there's no other way to say it, of what's really happening on the ground. I mean, it's to the point, Jamal, this is really crazy. Part of the Israeli Hasbara is to introduce doubt about the word genocide, okay? We know that a genocide is occurring in Palestine right now in Gaza. It is a fact. It's been, you know, determined by anybody who sees the reality on the ground. But the Israeli Hasbara is introducing this concept. Well, maybe is it genocide? Maybe not it's it's absolutely bizarre that the media has taken on the Israeli talking point without giving the deserved and honorable thing to do is to really talk about what's happening on the ground in Gaza right now and in the West Bank, Jamal, because we don't even have to t- we don't have time to talk about what's happening in the West Bank right now because Janine and other places in the West Bank, Palestinians are getting killed, journalists are getting imprisoned, and it's really, really very bad in the West Bank also. So we have to confront the media every day on this, Jamal, because they're not doing, well, they're not doing their job, they're doing the Israeli job. You're absolutely right. Moving on to our next story, Jess, which is really, again, another disturbing story. So you have a resolution. A resolution. An emergency. emergency. It's an emergency. 
raised, raised by Mr. Gutierrez to call for a ceasefire. I mean, this is not, it's not to reprimand Israel. It's not to do this, to do that. It's just saying a lot of civilians are getting killed. We're getting the news. And this is the United Nations. They have boots on the ground. They have UNRWA working there. They have, uh, they hear it from hospitals. They hear it from doctors. And they hear it again from UN officials that there is a massacre going on in Gaza. And the only country that votes against this resolution, which has a veto power, which is the United States, with Britain abstaining, you know, cowardly abstaining, everyone else, and that they kill this resolution. Uh, today, I, I've heard, I started reading about calls to reform the UN Security Council yes. after, after this US veto, because again, if we look at the history of the United States, more than it's 50% vetoes that were basically put on the floor of the United, uh, United, uh, United Nations Security Council were on behalf of Israel. I mean, That's right. as if there are no other issues in the entire world that you have, I think, something like 54% of all United States vetoes were cast because of Israel. And, and, and then you have few countries around the world. The, 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 the demography across the globe is changing. You have different powers and so forth. And then just a handful of people. I mean, I, I still, okay, even aside from the United States, you have Britain has a veto power. France has, you know, this is something like archaic and, 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 and something from what uh, decision that they've made um, after World War II that's to right. give those few countries the veto power. Therefore, you could run around in the, in, in the United Nations, in front of the United Nations, and if one of these countries decide, oh, well, we don't like what you're saying, we're going to veto you. And that's what happened. And, and, and we're talking about this one, why this is a very important resolution. This is not about reprimanding, as I said, a country, or it's about um, ending a war completely. This is about a ceasefire to protect civilians. That's all it is, Jamal. It's just about stop killing civilians and getting humanitarian aid in. Here's a novel idea with the Security Council. How about nobody has a veto power and you just do a majority vote? Exactly. If you, d if you did that, Jamal, Israel would be universally condemned day after day, month after month, year after year, and decade after decade. It's because the United States has decided to veto this emergency resolution to basically allow Israel off the hook. And Ambassador Greenfield, Secretary of State Blinken, President Biden have all issued this morally depraved statement. They say a ceasefire would only help Hamas, which is delusional. A ceasefire will save lives, Jamal. A ceasefire will allow humanitarian aid to come in. A ceasefire will allow hospitals to be restocked with supplies and medicines to save uh, children and women and adults who are dying and being killed every day. So the bizarreness, the moral depravity of Greenfield, of Blinken, of Biden is just sickening to the entire world community. It's just beyond the pale. It's not only sickening, just but it's really embarrassing to every American. I mean, if, if every American watches this, that, that you are the only country what, that basically stands for a slaughter, stands for, to su support a genocide. I mean, we, we, we talk about saving lives and we talk about human rights and, and, and so forth, but, you know, this is a resolution really to protect life. I mean, I mean, what more than this that you need to talk about human rights when you are seeing children getting killed, when you see babies in incubators left to die, and then you decide to say, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's like a game. It's like a chess game. We want to see Israel win, even though, and we're talking about Israel has not won. It's been like how many days now? Uh, you know, we're talking about the, almost the superpower almost of the months. Middle East, a nuclear power. You know, uh, and uh, it, it's really very troubling because the, sa the very same day that um, this resolution, this this veto basically uh, was provided by the United States, the United States authorized, uh, or the Biden administration, I should say, bypassed Congress and they authorized the shipment of more 
bombs and missiles to Israel. That's right, Jamal. More bombs without going through Congress and special bombs, Jamal, special missiles, special uh, ammunition for the Makurva tanks, which are deadly and are going to undoubtedly kill hundreds, if not thousands, of Palestinian civilians. That uh, the Biden administration and decided to do this, again, as you said, bypassing Congress. So this is why when we say, do not believe the White House, do not believe the State Department, do not believe the spokespeople when they say from the White House or from the State Department, oh, we're trying to protect, we put pressure on Israel, we don't want civilians, we have to, it's all complete BS, Jamal. Because look at the facts on the ground. They vetoed a resolution calling for a ceasefire and they're sending more deadly ammunition to the Israelis without congressional oversight in order to kill more Palestinian civilians, more children, more women. The blood is on the hands of the United States for every single death that goes on in Gaza, in Palestine right now, Jamal. And we need to be very clear about it. Do not believe the BS that's coming out of the White House or the State Department. No, because they're actually uh, recently I've actually also read that the Biden administration, I don't know if this is true or not, has given Israel up to the end of the year. Like, again, they play with the lives of, of civilians up to the end, end of the year and quote unquote to finish the job up to the end of the year. I don't know why the end of the year, but up to the end of the year to finish the job, maybe so that Biden can focus on his uh, election campaign. But then we're talking about you know another tw another twenty days, and and we know every single day more and more Palestinians and more civilians die, and Israel just keep bombing and bombing, and that's what I want to go and move on to our next story because now they're trying to pre to to provide okay if 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 we're talking about now how many days since uh, the, since October seventh and since Israel started its uh, uh, it's grand... almost two months yes it's almost two and, months and, and and they haven't finished. Hamas. I mean, this is this is if this is the end game. We are talking again: tanks, helicopters, F-16s, bombs, missiles falling on Gaza. They're leveling every single block by block. Really, uh, today there was another massacre in Jabalia. I watched it uh, in in real time uh, on 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 TV. I just can't describe the images that I saw and the the the, the corpses and the children they were pulling from beneath the rubble. But anyway, we're giving them again the, the means, the money, the weapons to continue this. And there is no progress on that. And this is very important because they are trying to look. And this is where Hasbaris, every single day, they're trying to show that they are making progress. Yes, the tanks can make it. Of course, the tanks, when you have a whole battalion of tanks going into civilian areas. Of course, that's like they're trying to show this as victory. But what have they been doing? They just like being killing civilians, destroying homes, destroying hospitals, bombing schools, and so on. And and uh, and then uh, this is the the other big story because they're trying to show this as a victory. They're rounding up civilians, men, and they're uh, humiliating them, torturing them, and making them to to uh, undress. They blindfold them, they strip them in their underwear. Put them in uh, uh, in trucks and and drive them uh, in the cold. And you know the weather now is getting very cold. It's freezing. Uh, it's, uh, they sit by the beach in the freezing cold, getting humiliated, uh, interrogated. And I saw one of the poor guys. They 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 let them go after midnight, uh, walk barefoot all the way to their home to find their homes being ransacked. So 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 people because they saw these reports. Uh, you could see these images, and and everybody knows everyone in Gaza just, and people start to recognize and say, these are Hamas, which is, of course, they are not Hamas members. And someone was saying, this is Dr. So-and-so. This is a, this person is a journalist. We know his name and so forth. This, this is the local grocery store owner and so forth. They recognize them, every single one of them. So so the, the, the latest farce they had to present just, is start uh, bring a couple of guns and hand them over. And someone caught onto this because they had the guy come and surrender a gun, holding the gun in his right hand, and then they'd show another video of the guy doing the same thing, but he's holding the gun in his left hand. Like, <laughs> take one, take two. <laughs> you know, you have these soldiers sal surrounding you. You're in your underway. They, they tell you, do it, or we're going to shoot you. And everybody recognizes these people. This is how sick, I would say, how depraved and sick and desperate 
to show, especially for Netanyahu, especially now we are in the holidays and the end of the year, to show that he has shown some victory. And I'm going to add another story to this, Jess, which is the botched operation to uh, rescue one of the, oh, yeah. I would say, Israeli prisoners of war because he is a soldier. Right. And 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 so they wanted to show again we can do that. We are there. We we are uh, we 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 know what we're doing. We're targeting Hamas and then of course the soldiers get killed in the in the battle. Uh, at least two Israeli soldiers get severely wounded. It's a botched operation and they ended up Israel basically the Israeli so-called defense forces the IDF killed its own soldier. This exactly. is what Netanyahu had to show. And then they tried to blame it on Hamas, saying that he, they executed him. What are you talking about? They executed him. They went just, I don't know if you know that, but they used yeah, yeah. an ambulance. They disguised, right. which is a violation international law of, uh, of international law. They talk about Palestinians or Hamas members using an ambulance. They went in a in the, disguised using a Red Cross ambulance to go where, wherever they got the intelligence that this uh, soldier was being held and then ended up in his death and in their demise. Well, Jamal, that's that's the typical Israeli pattern because I think what you're pointing at is that they are they are actually losing. They are actually losing their military objectives in Gaza right now. And uh, everybody knows this and we're seeing leaked reports, you know, coming from various intelligence sources in other countries basically saying, uh, the military objectives that the Israeli military have identified are not being accomplished. They are actually losing in many ways. And, you know, you know, at least what we know of is 100 Israeli soldiers have been More killed. More than 100. Actually, just 10 within the past 48 hours, 10 were right. killed. Right. And 5,000 5, injured, two here, of them severely injured. Yeah, but, but here's the thing, Jamal. Hamas, they, Hamas is not destroyed. Hamas is not defeated. Um, the only thing that's happening is that uh, Palestinian civilians are getting slaughtered. Gaza is becoming inhabitable, uh, uninhabitable. Gaza uh, is becoming hell on earth right now. So the reality of the Israeli objective is not really a military objective, Jamal. What it is is this unending, as Rashid Khalidi has, uh, Khalidi has said, it's the hundred year war uh, that the Israelis are engaging in by trying to ethnically cleanse and remove Palestinians from Palestine, from historic Palestine. This is their goal. Let's be clear about it, Jamal. There is no military objective here. Is there? If you look at what's happening no, on no, the ground because, right now. Uh, for one thing, if Israel cared about its own hostages, they, they would have accepted the ceasefire and had that exchange. And then this is an example. And some other hostages got killed again by the Israeli bombing through Israeli bombing. So they don't care about their own hostages. They they have this uh, Hannibal whatever doctrine where they wanna just kill as many people as possible. It doesn't matter if they kill civilians or or not. They are killing mostly civilians and destroying infrastructure there. And we know for a fact now all the information is no longer. We don't say that it has been leaked, but because now it's a it's a common knowledge that the objective was to push Palestinians into the Sinai Desert, take over Gaza with the blessing of the United States, with the United States and other other, other European countries bribing uh, Egypt by paying uh, by forgiving its loans and so forth, and Egypt refused to do so. So so they they failed on that end because they thought that was that was their game. It wasn't about Hamas. I mean, if we're talking about Hamas, Hamas, how many thousand maybe? 10,000 members uh, who are fighters in Hamas. You are talking about 2.2 million Palestinians who are, who are getting slaughtered on a daily basis. You're talking about the whole population. You're talking about the entire country, cities being destroyed. And if, 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 if that objective, the objective, like if it's objective number one, number two, which is like to, to destroy Hamas, we're talking about 20,000 people. And they're talking about now less than 150, or about 150 plus Israeli hostages, which they don't care about, because we saw Hamas actually was willing to exchange uh, hostages, and so their objective really is goes back to let's destroy Gaza, make it like as he said, inhabitable, inhabitable, so the population will leave uh, to to Egypt or 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 somewhere else. And we're listening to politicians. I forgot his last name, like this uh, Max something, 
Max, uh, the congressman who said that uh, he's waiting to see Gaza turn to a, into a parking lot. That's exactly right, Jamal. This is the this is the craziness that's coming. The 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 kind of ethnic cleansing language that is coming from the Congress. We know that that ethnic cleansing language is part of the Israeli mindset and Netanyahu and his right wing extremist cabinet. But we see it seeping down even within the U.S. Congress, who, as we've reported on Jamal, there was a ceasefire vote that uh, universally was uh, you know uh, uh, you know. Uh, voted against. I mean, the the kind of craziness in the U.S. Congress right now mimics the craziness in the Israeli Knesset. And this kind of mind melding, if you will, between right wing extremists uh, who are calling for ethnic cleansing in the Knesset and the Israeli uh, political system is mimicked in the U.S. Congress right now because the Congress is not doing anything. They're getting all you know they're they're willing to attack Ivy League presidents because you know who believe in free speech, but they're willing to let go uh, unspoken about the number of uh, uh, Palestinians that are getting murdered each day. It's it's a pretty crazy world right now. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco, eighty nine point five FM. Go to our website arabtalkradio.com to download the latest shows, and we'll speak to you next week. We'll see you next week.